Welcome back to the Pelvic Health Summit. I'm your host, Hannah Matluck, and we are here today with Dr. Georgine Lambu, the chair of the International Pelvic Pain Society. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. You're most welcome. My pleasure. So can you first tell us how you got started with this International Pelvic Pain Society and what your role is? Um, I first uh, was exposed to the IPPS in 1997, um, and I was basically a resident, and we had no resources whatsoever for taking care of pain patients, and we had a lot of patients. And one of my mentors suggested that I join this brand new group that was brainstorming on how to improve pain education, and it turned out to be the IPPS, so I've been with it uh, pretty much since it began. So what are the main, the main things that IPPS does? We mostly focus on fostering education for healthcare providers and patients, but the primary goal is to generate better physicians, better healthcare providers who understand the complexities of our pain patients. Um, we foster awareness um, because we want people to understand this is a real healthcare problem in our society. And we want to foster hope because we want patients to know that there are good providers out there, there are treatment options, and we just want you to go find those providers and stay on top of your health care and we, you'll do fine. And can you talk about some of the ways that you guys are working on reaching these providers, finding access to the best providers, and how you can spread this knowledge and these resources and awareness to the rest of the world? So um, the first thing we do is we have a huge annual scientific meeting every year where we invite providers from all over the world and they come in and they learn um, about chronic pelvic pain disorders. Um, it's a combination of scientists and clinicians um, and from across all specialties. Um, then we also have a lot of online um, resources, so educational videos, um, um, uh, we do a research news update for providers to make sure that they stay up to date with the research on pelvic pain. We generate a provider reading list every year, um, which basically is a list that we recommend that they read so that they um, stay up to date on everything that's changing in, in pain management. Uh, we foster uh, collaboration and research, so we support some research grants and educational programs. We um, have scholarships for residents and fellows, so these are uh, providers that are very, very early on in their career to come and learn. Um, and for patients, we have a whole slew of patient education pamphlets, um, pretty much one for every single pain disorder you can think of in the pelvis. And those are available free online. Um, we have a find a provider resource uh, where patients can go in and put in their geographic region and find out by specialty who takes care of pain. Um, we also have a... Um, um, uh, an awareness event every month. Uh, it's uh, every May, excuse me. It's called the May's um, uh, Pelvic Pain Awareness Month, where we hold different events across the nation to bring awareness to um, pelvic pain. Uh, I'm trying to think of all the things. Oh, we have for providers. We have a listserv where they can call and ask questions. Um, and then, oh, and there's a marketplace where uh, patients and providers can go and purchase um, things for, for pain management. Amazing. I think that's it. <laughs> that's a tremendous amount of resources and ways that people can access all this information. So thank you for being such a crucial and large role in IPPS and the work that, that you all are doing. So IPPS really is for both patients and practitioners, correct? Yes, it is. Membership is only for providers, right? Because they actually have to pay money to be a member and have access to all those additional. But the, um, pain, the pain education resources are available to patients for free because we want them to have access to that regardless of membership. And how did you first get involved in IPPS? What led you to want to be a part of this work? You know, it was out of desperation. I would see patients in clinic um, that were they just had so much pain and they were so desperate for help. And at that particular point, 
in my career, I really didn't have a way of helping patients, but I had a great mentor and we had a lot of colleagues that knew about pain management. And so it was just a matter of getting out of my own gynecologic specialty to go into those other pain specialty uh, fields and learn about pain and then bring all that information back into my own field and promote research and education. And uh, it's been you know, over 15 years now, I think we've done a great job. Um, people know about pelvic pain a lot more. They understand that it takes multidisciplinary teams. I mean, really huge collaborative teams to be able to take appropriate care of our patients. So now they're all coming to the table with different types of contributions. And it's so true that we need all of these practitioners and advocates to be able to spread the information and the knowledge that, that the world needs to acknowledge that pelvic pain is real and is treatable. So thank you for being a large leading role and figure in this awareness movement. It's really, really amazing work and it's helping so many people. From your perspective, how have you seen pelvic pain, the recognition of pelvic pain and the awareness surrounding it evolve over the past 10 years? Um, you know, from my perspective, it's changed drastically. I mean, when I started in this field, gynecologists weren't even willing to acknowledge that our patients who had pelvic pain were sane, <laughs> let alone provide multidisciplinary care. And now we understand that, you know, our patients are very sane and they experience this pain sometimes on a daily basis. And and we understand that there's actually a lot that we can do for this type of pain. And it takes a combination of things um, to, you know, to be able to take care of the patients um, and, and combinations of therapies, both physical and surgical and mental and um, all sorts of things. Um, but we can make a difference. Um, the other thing that I like to um, remind folks is that there used to be a time when it was actually almost shameful to say that you have pelvic pain or that you have sexual pain, right? Vaginal pain, penetrating pain. I mean, women never talked about that, those, that type of pain because it was, they were ashamed. And, and then we had lots of research that actually showed that physicians, not only were patients not talking about it, but when they actually mustered enough strength to talk about it, physicians were dismissive. And that was just really sad to me. Um, but I think it was a reaction from the, from the provider side. It wasn't so much that they didn't care, but it was just that they were just frustrated because they didn't know what to do. And so once we can change that with education and once the attitudes started changing, now we're seeing lots of just different patient physician interactions, like people actually talk and listen to each other in the clinical setting, which is really, right? It's very different than what it used to be because you would go in, say two words, then your doctor would say like 10 words and you'd be out the door <laughs> with no solution. And that's changed quite a bit now for pain management. So I, um, my dream is, you know, when, when the Institute of Medicine came out in 2011 and they published a big report, it was called Relieving Pain in America. And one of the things they said in that report is that, is that at that point in time, there were a little bit under 4,000 um, healthcare providers that were registered as a pain specialist. And there were 100 million people with pain. So that's about 25,000 patients per provider. Well, that's not realistic, right? I mean, even if we have those 4,000 providers became the best providers on the planet, they still could not take care of all the patients that needed them, that need them. So my goal really became, okay, well, why don't we change strategy? Instead of just generating very, very specific pain specialists, why don't we take all specialties and teach them all about maybe even just the basics of taking care of pain patients so at least patients can get some initial management, good management or treatment before they get to a pain specialist. So we're working on that. <laughs> And through, through my work with pelvic pain and, and my experience with pelvic pain, what I've noticed is that there seems to be gynecologists and then gynecologists who specialize in pelvic pain. And that oftentimes if you're a woman with pelvic floor, pelvic floor dysfunction, pelvic health issues, sexual pain, vaginal pain, 
bladder pain, you have to see a gynecologist or urologist who specializes in pelvic pain in order for them to be able to properly diagnose and treat you. Do you see in the future that more standard gynecologists will be able to better diagnose women with pelvic pain? Uh, yes, they better, right? Because, I mean, our patients are going nowhere. Um, they're going to be there, and we know population numbers are growing. We, so we, the need's going to be there. Um, so I think, yeah, absolutely, gynecologists, urologists, every single specialty. And I will even dare to say right here on video camera that even anesthesiologists that are considered, right, the ultimate pain specialists still have a lot to learn about pelvic pain syndromes in women. Um, so female pelvic pain syndromes, I think, are still really, really largely ignored in the pain specialty field. Um, and some would argue that even for males, males who have chronic pelvic pain really just have no resources. I mean, right now they can see some urologists, but once, for whatever reason, I don't know what happened in medical school, but once the pain dropped below the belt, it was as if we just <laughs> decided to ignore it. And we, we know now that we, we can't do that, and that's changing uh, rapidly. So we just need help spreading the education, and we will eventually get there. <laughs> Definitely. Without a doubt, I believe it. And can you share with us where you see the future of IPPS and perhaps what are some things that IPPS is currently working on to promote awareness? Um, so right now we're uh, getting ready for the busy month of May and May is uh, Pelvic Pain Awareness Month. So this is when um, different um, I IPPS members hold awareness events across the nation. So we're having a couple in Orlando and there's some in New York and there's, you know, usually somewhere, uh, I think, I think last year we had seven or eight events across the nation. Um, and those are usually patient oriented. So these are uh, events where patients can go in and talk to a pain specialist and find out more about the resources that they have available. So we're doing that for May. Um, we are also getting ready for a big international meeting. So we are making a big effort to reach out to international providers as well, because we know that the problem of pelvic pain is actually huge worldwide, not just in the United States. So our meeting is um, going to be in Toronto this year, and um, we'll be collaborating with um, CanSage, um, and we'll be focusing, bringing in some big speakers on endometriosis and really taking the big multidisciplinary approach to endometriosis because there's a big debate, right, about whether surgery or medical therapy is best for endometriosis. And what we're saying is, if you look at the research, you actually need both. <laughs> that there's actually, in the setting of chronic pelvic pain with endometriosis, there's not going to be a complete cure with just surgery or just medication. So we need to get the big minds from the surgical field together with the big minds from the medical field to collaborate. Um, then we are, um, besides our big annual meeting, we have a big drive. We are uh, doing a fundraising drive and a membership drive, so to speak. So the goal is to get to 1,000 members by the year 2020. We're just, I think, around 800 right now. Um, so we are, you know, the more members we have, then we know that that's more educated providers that we can have. Um, and then um, we are doing a fundraising drive to raise money for some um, research grants and more educational programs. And I think it's really important to know that essentially almost 100% of all the funds that we raise goes back into the society and the programs that we uh, create because actually the IPPS does not have any employees except for our management team. So we have to hire obviously a management team to manage all these folks. But um, all the people who are on the board of directors, uh, the advisory board, all the committees that do all this work to create all these programs and educational pamphlets and so forth, they all do this for free. It's volunteer work. Uh, so this is just to tell you how dedicated these society members are. I mean, they're really, really passionate about improving health care for women with pain and men and people in between and transgender and binary and gender. Non all, everyone is welcome to the IPPS educational materials because they cross all genders. Um, I think that's pretty much, I think, our agenda for until 2020. <laughs> so we have a lot. Uh, we're, we're staying busy. <laughs> 
Well, thank you again for all of the work that you and IPPS are doing together. It's really helping to transform the world's knowledge and understanding of pelvic pain. And where can everyone listening, if they want to get in touch with you, where can they contact you? So it's very easy. There is a info at pelvicpain.org. So that's our email. I get all those emails, by the way, and I answer all of them. So please be kind because sometimes it takes me a couple of days to get back. Um, then um, you can get additional information on our website at uh, www.pelvicpain.org. Um, we also are on Facebook. And um, on Facebook, you can follow us as the International Pelvic Pain Society or the Pelvic Pain Society. And we're on Instagram as well. And Twitter. I think we're on Twitter too. I don't tweet very much. You know, I just haven't quite figured out the tweeting thing yet. <laughs> Me neither, but I'm trying. <laughs> Um, okay, I think that's it for today, but thank you again for taking the time to be here and talk with us. We really appreciate it, and I know that this is going to resonate with so many people, and I encourage everyone to go on IPPS website and read and learn and find practitioners that are in your area and that can help you to navigate the challenging world of pelvic pain. Thank you again. It's my pleasure.